and asks the media to help him avoid racial strife in the campaign. Police Commissioner Ben Ward becomes a campaign issue after a serious case of foot and mouth disease. A commuter tax war looms as surprised out-of-state workers in New York get socked with a new tax. And a Long Island man wins the right to an abortion for his comatose wife. But the decision doesn't end the protests. Join us. This program has been made possible by a grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Charitable Trust as part of its commitment to New Jersey public affairs programming. Major funding was also provided by the members of 13. I'm Marlene Sanders. Tonight on Metro Week in Review, we'll look at the entry of David Dinkins into the mayoral sweepstakes. The big question, has the time come for a black mayor, and is Dinkins the man? The present mayor apologizes for anti-Latino remarks made by police commissioner Ben Ward, and some suggest that Ward may become a liability for Koch as the campaign heats up. Meanwhile, New Jersey leaders are mobilizing to fight a higher tax that took them and their state's commuters by surprise. And in the wake of the Nancy Klein case, pro- and anti-abortion forces continue to battle in the streets and in the courts. Joining me are Dick Sander of New York Newsday, Miguel Perez of the Daily News, David Blumquist of The Record, and Pat Milton of the Associated Press. To no one's surprise, David Dinkins finally confirmed he's running for mayor. His announcement set off a political chain reaction with several other candidates dropping out. The low-key borough president promised a high-level campaign. And Dick, isn't that what uh, Michael Dukaka said? And it didn't work out too well for him. He said the same thing, and we don't know whether it'll work out well for Mr. Dinkins or not. But uh, in the first place, I guess we have to look at the field, and he's sort of uh, scared out uh, Charles uh, Joe Hines, the special prosecutor. It looks now like, uh, well, Ruth Messenger had mentioned at one time, councilwoman, that she might run. She's out. Um, Andy Stein, still a question mark. Uh, um, and... Uh, so we have, Ravage we have Ra Ravage is, uh, it looks like he's going to be in at this point, and, and so does Jay Golden, the controller. So that's, that's how it lines up. Now, as far as uh, a high-level campaign, I, I, I think that uh, Ed Koch and uh, Jay Golden will take care of that and make sure that it, uh, it's not. Uh, uh, how, Dinks, how Dinkins plays it, uh, uh, is, a, is a real question. Is I think Dinkins he's tough enough it. to deal with the mayor in a campaign? He, uh, he says he is. I mean, he keeps saying his, uh, his year or two in the Marine Corps uh, shows that uh, he's a very tough fella. Um, uh, he has a reputation of being a, a gentleman, uh, a scholar, a really nice, a nice chap. Uh, uh, he's going to, uh, I think, have to uh, show a, a harder side uh, uh, to the people to, uh, to, to let them know he means business. He said something unusual in his announcement that uh, he had made an appeal to the media to help make it sure this is not a dirty racist campaign. Is that appropriate? And really what could media do in that case? Well, I, I think it's probably appropriate. I don't know that anyone is really going to... Uh, uh, I, I think the job of the media will be to report the campaign. Uh, and uh, you know, if it uh, if it seems to be slipping into uh, uh, that type of, uh, of a gutter campaign, it has to be reported. Uh, uh, I don't think David will do anything to exacerbate it. Uh, but again, I, I think he'll try and stay above the fray. Uh, whether he'll be successful, question. Do you think the media will have any special expectations of him because he is a black candidate, and the first one again in a while? Uh, well, everybody's going to be looking at him to see, uh, I think, uh, in, in, in the sense that uh, I think they'll watch to see what kind of an appeal he has, particularly to uh, uh, minority folks, blacks and Latinos. Uh, and whether he can pull together such a coalition. Whether, exactly. I think there's an expectation, Miguel, that uh, a black candidate will naturally draw the 
Latino vote. Is that wrong? Well, I, 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 I don't think it's wrong. I think the large majority of Latinos uh, believe that they, they see the f their future as a, with an alliance with blacks. They see that uh, the only way to empower themselves is, is recognizing that blacks have gone through the same things that we Latinos are going through now. They've, they've had a lot more experience in civil rights than we have. They've sort of um, opened the road for us in many ways, and the only course for Latinos, I think a lot of the leadership, the progressive leadership realizes, is by uniting with the blacks. Uh, the problem is that within our community we find people like Herman Badillo at this point still considering running and what, would that, what that would do is basically split up the minority vote and basically maybe uh, get Koch re-elected if that was to happen because uh, Badillo would basically take a lot of votes away from Mr. Dinkins. Well I, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of pressure on uh, Mr. Badillo not to get into uh, That's right. Uh, That's right because what has happened is that bef uh, already before Mr. Dinkins made his announcement most of the uh, Hispanic leadership had already endorsed, endorsed Dinkins. Right. So, uh, you know, they're already committed to Dinkins, most of the Hispanic elected officials. So what happens now if Badillo throws his but hat in the He's been out of politics for quite a while. Why would he do that except as a spoiler? Well, that's precisely what I called him a few weeks ago when I wrote about this thing because what happened was that uh, four years ago, Mr. Badillo was the man who had the shot and the black community didn't give him the, 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 the backing that he deserved then. And maybe what he's doing is getting back at them now. And two wrongs don't make a right. Mm. And what Denny Farrell did four years ago, he became a, a symbolic candidate for the black leadership. He, they knew he wasn't going to get elected, but they wanted a black anyway. Well, that, that's what would happen with Badillo now. Not to dwell uh, on, on Badillo for, uh, for too long a period, but he is, uh, you know, an historic p uh, figure in New no York question. City. And, no and, and among Latinos, I'm sure. So we probably, and very qualified. Uh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. so, what is, what is, here we're talking about Dinkins has announced. What's he got going for him? I mean, what well, do we know? What he has going for him is, is uh, he is uh, he's been a spokesman and a, and a, and a rather eloquent so a spokesman, I think, for the borough of Manhattan. He sits on his his biggest job is sitting on the board of Estimate, uh, which, as you know, uh, handles budget matters, franchises, contracts, uh, and so forth. Uh, he's been a spokesman on uh, issues that affect uh, uh, the poor, uh, uh, particularly in the area of the homeless and. Uh, and infant care, children. So he's, he, uh, he has that kind of a reputation. Uh, clearly, it's not the kind of administrative uh, 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 record uh, as, as the mayor has. I mean, his office just doesn't uh, And what uh, can Koch that. use against him in the campaign? Oh, uh, well, perhaps, uh, perhaps that, that, uh, that he doesn't have a, 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 a record uh, comparable to, to the mayor's. Uh, and also, I'm afraid uh, that uh, knowing Koch's uh, tendency to go for the jugular, or at least I believe he's got that tendency, uh, perhaps uh, the old, old issue of, uh, of taxes. Uh, uh, Dinkins has attempted to explain that. He didn't pay his taxes for four years in the 60s and, and, and freely admits it was a matter of procrastination. And, uh, and Dinkins also was a Jesse Jackson supporter. Do you see a role for Jackson in this campaign? Well, I do, and I think uh, this is a this is a really tricky one. I, I think uh, Jackson certainly will be in to uh, uh, to help Dinkins. Uh, I think uh, David has to uh, maximize uh, the uh, the black vote uh, and and the Latino vote, vote if it's possible. And I think Jesse could do that. On the other hand, uh, he may scare some other folks. Well, it is going to be a tough race, and there's general agreement that Mayor Koch needs all the help in the minority community that he can get. So one would think that the mayor might call on the city's first black police commissioner, a high-profile Koch appointment, for help in the campaign. But these days, Benjamin Ward might not be everyone's idea of an asset. The commissioner's recent questionable comments, what he calls Wardisms, offended many members of the Latino community and even caused a rift between black and Latino officers in the NYPD. Mikel, why does Ward keep saying these things? That's a great question. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think he knows. Um, 
Uh, in Puerto Rico, they have a phrase. I think uh, the problem is that he is, uh, for a public official, he's very rough at the edges. He, 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 if he gets off a prepared text, he's in trouble. And uh, in Puerto Rico, they have a phrase for people like that. They, they, have, they call them un batata con corbata. This means a sweet potato with a tie. <laughs> and, 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 and the commissioner really, really personifies this, this they call this politicians in Puerto Rico, but uh, who, are, who are rough at the edges and who, who make such statements. But the problem with the commissioner, and I don't know if he's going to be an asset to the mayor, uh, uh, the problem with the commissioner is that now the Hispanic community has decided to ignore him. Basically what they've done, the Hispanic leadership has gotten together and they've gone directly to the mayor and they have pr uh, presented him with a list of recommendations of what, to, what should be done within the police department. And the main complaint really is that there are no, not enough Hispanics in decision-making positions within the department. It's not one figurehead like, uh, like Ward is, uh, solving the problem. That cannot solve the problem. Uh, you have to have people in decision-making positions. But haven't, uh, under Ward's uh, regime, there been more Hispanic uh, uh, members of the police force? Yes. What has happened is, actually, uh, it's almost doubled. The, uh, the number of Hispanics in the police department. But it's not because of Ward. It's because the courts have mandated it. The, uh, the uh, Puerto Rican Legal Defense Fund had to take the police department to court to get this to happen. It's also because Latinos are ap applying in higher numbers than any other group. It's also, uh, and then what, what happens is that you have these tests that basically discriminate against Latinos. A lot of Latinos are failing this test because of the way it's worded. And so uh, a test that, may, that is not even used by police departments any longer in many, many states is still used by the New York City Police Department. So it basically discriminates against Latino applicants. And the main point is that although the number has doubled, you still have 11% of the police department being Hispanic in a city that is almost 25% Hispanic. Also, the uh, head of the Hispanic Officer Society in the police department in talking about Ward called him a non-person. Now, I don't know what that's supposed to mean, but is this rift inside the police department affecting public safety in any that, way? That is, his name is Walter Alicea, and he's the president of the Hispanic Society of the Police Officers. And what he means by that, and when I've asked him, and what he means by that is that, is that they don't want to deal with Ward anymore. They have gone to Ward. They have presented him with all these requests, and he's ignored them. So now... What, he mean, what they mean by a non-person is we're not dealing with him anymore, we're going directly to the mayor. And the mayor has, has told them that he would respond within 30 days. And I think he will have to do something if he wants, if he wants to keep some of that Hispanic support that he does have, because the mayor does have some Hispanic support still. Don't it's amazing think be, to some don't of us. Don't you think it would be more of a liability, though, to get rid of uh, Ward at this time, yes, uh, since Dinkins is in the race? Well, you see, the, the Hispanic leadership, when they got together with Koch, they asked them not to not to fire the commissioner because they think it would be worse for them. They don't want Koch around, let's face it. And so what they've decided to do is they don't, if, if, Koch, if Koch fires his commissioner now, then he can turn to the Hispanic community and say, look, I did this for you, and then he can use this in his campaign. So they don't want him fired. They just don't want to deal with him at all. They want to totally ignore him. Well, what, is, uh, what does Dinkins do with uh, uh, Ben Ward? Does he... Uh Dinkins has already, the other day when he announced his candidacy, he, he spoke he about it. He seemed to duck it, I he think. He ducked the, the, the issue and he said basically, uh, he, he sort of agreed with the Hispanic leadership when he said that what we need is higher ranking police officers throughout the department, but he ducked the question of, mm -hmm. of what he would do with the commission. Well, what should Koch do? Should he keep him or get rid of him? Oh, I, th I think at this point, it's not going to do him that much good or bad to, to, get, to get rid of him or not. I think he should just try to ignore the question at this point and try to deal with the real problem in the department, which is the real problem is really higher, of, higher ranking officers who can really make the decisions. So in the meantime, what everybody would like to do is just put a muzzle on the... Uh police commissioner until go. after the campaign. Well, everyone who works in New York is affected by the city's problems, but some can escape to New Jersey or Connecticut at the end of the day. Of course, those commuters don't vote in New York, and some state officials ought to be grateful about that, because non-resident workers have just discovered they'll be paying higher taxes to the state of New York for the privilege of working there. Senator Bill Bradley calls the new tax an outrage that is nothing short of robbery. And that's one of the nicest things that's being said about it. David, what is this new tax everybody's so agitated about? Well, like most tax stories, Marlene, this is a tale about loopholes and fine print. 
About two years ago, uh, the Cuomo administration undertook a massive overhaul of New York State's tax code. It was directed at a lot of things, uh, but essentially it had the goals of making New York taxes simpler, more rational, and more fair. One small part of that reform was aimed at non-residents. And the principle was this. Why should a wealthy person pay only as much in tax as a hardworking family from Queens just because they happen to go home at night to New Jersey or Connecticut. So starting in 1988, a little tiny piece in the law said that New York taxes from non-residents would be collected based on their total income. That doesn't mean that New York would start taxing money that was actually earned out of state. That, it's clear legally that they cannot do that but that New York would start setting the rate of tax, the bracket in which people are, based upon all of the money that they earn. Now that really mainly affects a, a two-income family. Absolutely. Let's take a, a very quick example of it. A couple in which one spouse earns $25,000 a year in New York and $25,000 a year in New Jersey. Under this new law, they will start paying 50, uh, their New York tax based on a $50,000 a year bracket. For many people, that is a significant increase uh, in taxes, a liability that may be several hundred dollars. This was passed in New York two years ago. How, why was it just discovered now? Didn't anybody know about it? Well, there, there are several reasons. First of all, it really was just one piece of a, of a bill that was three quarters of an inch thick. Second, it was a piece that had no immediate effect. It, 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 didn't, uh, it didn't do anything right away. Third, there was what many New Jerseyans are, are, and, and people in Connecticut are calling a, uh, an arrogant attitude on the, on the part of New York State. They felt, uh, the New York State Tax Department felt they did not have an obligation to tell anybody about pieces of the bill that didn't affect uh, residents. You know, they're not, they're not constituents. Uh, they may be taxpayers, but they're not constituents. So finally, the way that this came to light was when a, uh, a business school professor uh, who works in New York at, at Columbia telephoned my colleague Ron Stepneski uh, a couple of weeks ago and said, I'm filling out my tax form and, and there's this thing I don't understand. Uh, Stepneski telephoned New Jersey uh, officials who were flabbergasted to find out about the change. And uh, the rest is history. And Miguel, you happen to... They actually uh, found out, they actually found out now, uh, the New Jersey officials just found out what, about this law two, two years weeks ago. ago. Pennsylvania officials found out about it four days ago in a telephone call from me. Uh, Connecticut officials found out about it four days ago in a call from the New York Times. Nobody saw this one in there, and New York, the New York State Tax Department had apparently taken no effort to call up the, the, the states that border New York and let them know that a new, a new regulation was going into effect. Okay, Miguel, you're one of these people affected. affected you live in New Jersey. I is this a shock to you? Work, if, of course it is. Of course it is. And, and, and what, I'm, what I'm wondering is where were, were my, my representatives in New Jersey at this point, and why, why didn't they alarm me that this was happening as a citizen? John Baldwin, the director of the, of the New York State, uh, the New, York, New Jersey Tax Department, claims, well, it, it wouldn't make any sense for us to invest the man hours in combing through every page of tax legislation of every state in the country to important. keep track of how it might, yeah, well, but when there are 234,000 uh, citizens in your state who cross the border to one particular jurisdiction, uh, maybe you might want to keep tabs with what's going on. Well, what's going to happen? That's it's the amazing to me. This is the first time I can remember a secret being kept up in Albany. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Uh, that's they didn't uh, want this one out, I don't think. <laughs> what's what's going to happen? Well, there's clearly going to be a legal challenge from New Jersey, uh, from somebody in New Jersey uh, to it. How far it will go isn't clear. The basic formula that New York is using has been implemented in other states a little differently and has survived court challenges. The, the best outcome that could happen here is that uh, New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut would agree uh, to talk to each other henceforth about changes that they make in their tax code so that there would be no surprises. Uh, the worst outcome that, that could, could happen would be a tax bashing circus with retaliatory uh, uh, action being taken on all sides. In the meantime, people had better pay up this time around. Well, there are, uh, there are some lawmakers who want to try and get an injunction before April 15th. Of course, that doesn't do anything for the folks who thought they were being nice and sent the return in early. Mm -hmm. What can people do? What can a, a citizen do? To, like you. Yeah. Uh, what can I, who can I write? Uh, <laughs> well, uh, there will be some 
some legal action very shortly, and probably what you have to do is wait for a class action suit that will resolve the details. Well, while the tax wars are being fought across the New York and New Jersey border, there is another ongoing battle that knows no bounds, the fierce struggle over abortion rights. Just last week, some 300 people participated in anti-abortion protests in Woodbridge, New Jersey. But pro-choice advocates won a victory in the Klein case in Brookville, Long Island, when Martin Klein succeeded in obtaining an abortion for his comatose wife wife Nancy. Anti-abortion activists had petitioned the courts in an attempt to be appointed legal guardians of the fetus. Pat, who were the winners and the losers in this particular case? Clearly the, the winners are Martin Klein, the husband of Nancy Klein, and uh, the family. They had gone to court uh, seeking to be appointed legal guardian so that they could uh, authorize doctors to give an uh, abortion for his wife. Uh, she had been in a car accident. Uh, she was 18 weeks uh, pregnant, and some doctors had advised him that uh, it may enhance her recovery if the abortion procedure was done. Um, some other winners, uh, women's rights. Um, I think it was a boost, an advancement uh, for women's rights uh, to an abortion. Um, I think that the whole uh, pro-life uh, movement was uh, also given a boost. Uh, the losers. The interveners, um, the interveners being uh, anti-abortionists, they uh, was John Broderick and John Short, who have been very active nationally in the uh, anti-abortion movement. They uh, were called by the court uh, that they were uh, strangers and they had no right to be involved in this uh, private uh, family tragedy. And uh, I think that it uh, also uh, gave a blow to the right to life movement, um, just because they picked an issue where clearly they didn't belong in. It wasn't a class action. It wasn't a, an issue to rally around where, where um, you know, they could get an answer. The courts had thrown them out. Why wasn't this all handled privately? This was a hospital matter between the hospital and the family. How did it come to be a public issue? The um, fa Klein family were advised by the doctors uh, that possibly an abortion could uh, enhance the woman's recovery. She was in a deep coma and had been since the accident in December. And he went to the hospital officials and said he wanted this procedure done. And they balked at it and said, well, we've got to go to court and get a court order for that. So he had his attorneys go to court in a process that he told me he thought was only going to be about five minutes. He thought he would go in, be appointed legal guardian, and uh, authorize the abortion. But instead, um, the district attorney's office and the state attorney general's office was notified of it. They came into the case. And the publicity surrounding it brought in the anti-abortion movement who stepped in and said, no, we want to be representative of the woman and also representative of the but fetus. Could this happen again? Could any person who is not responsible, uh, they have to have a legal guardian appointed. Is, is that the rule? Yes, the courts deemed the woman to be incompetent and uh, incapable of making a decision. And uh, yes, it could happen again in the sense that uh, a court order would be necessary. But I don't think now, uh, this being a precedent-setting case in New York, I don't think now that uh, all of this controversy would swirl around a request. I think we have on the books in New York now um, the case where uh, the family was uh, told, yes, you can consent to an abortion. Pat, in recent years, the, the anti-abortion movement has shown increasing sophistication in, in picking their battles and in getting publicity. Why did they stumble on this one? I don't know. I think that uh, they saw it as an emotional issue. Uh, clearly, uh, New York State did not have anything uh, on the books of a comatose woman uh, that was pregnant. And they, they thought that uh, they could use this, I think, as a forum. And I think they, they thought that there was a slight chance they could win the case. And their main goal is to overturn uh, Roe versus Wade, uh, to overturn a uh, woman's right to have an abortion in this country. And anything that they can latch on to to do that, uh, that's, that's what their motivation is. Was the family politicized by this at all? I think the uh, family uh, is a very, very, very private family. Uh, they're wealthy. Um, they live on the north shore of Long Island, very wealthy uh, area. And I think they were uh, clearly uncomfortable with the publicity. I think they remain uncomfortable with the publicity. Uh, though her um, husband, uh, Martin Klein, he's an accountant in Manhattan, 
Um, he became uh, very articulate uh, on the issue, but I think he wants to just squirrel away uh, back into his home uh, with his family and, uh, and, and try to get help for his wife, who he really clearly dearly loves. What is her condition now that she's had the abortion in terms of her survival? Well, I talked to uh, the Klein family this morning, and uh, they feel that uh, they're very pleased and they feel convinced that they made the right decision to have the abortion. Uh, they said her heart rate has dropped dramatically from about, 100, uh, from about 130 to about 100. She's got color in her face, her eyes are opening wider. Uh, the woman is very, very severely brain damaged. She's only given about a 5% chance at recovery. But they feel now that the abortion procedure was done, they can get her into a rehabilitation center, which, by the way, would not take her because she was pregnant. They didn't want the added complication. So now they feel like they're moving forward. They feel they've seen some indication that maybe only a family member can see that uh, she is improving, although doctors say she remains the same critical and in guarded condition. Sad case. Yes. Well, I'm sure there we'll see some others like that before this is resolved by the Supreme Court. Yes. We're out of time. Thanks to our reporter guests and to you for being with us. I'm Marlene Sanders. See you next week.